thus far. Uh, chapter number one, uh, we dealt mainly with the fact that the Gentiles who had no law, they still had a way of um, righteousness unto themselves from uh, the invisible things. And then chapter two, it primarily talks about uh, the Jews who had the law, uh, even though they had the law. If they didn't obey it, it became unrighteousness to them. And then in chapter number three, um, he's going to be dealing with both Jew and Gentile. But um, let's look at chapter number four, beginning at verse number one. And uh, we begin at verse number one. And uh, the subtitle for this chapter in my Bible is Justification by Faith, Evidence, and Old Testament. Verse number one says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he was something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now I'm going to pause there for a second because um, God wants us to know that just as we don't work for salvation. Um, Abraham didn't work for salvation as well. Actually, he believed it was his faith. That's why we um, consider him the father of faith. And he's going to continue to clarify that in this chapter that he believed and it was accredited to him as righteousness. But um, he wasn't righteous just based on his behavior. And um, that's the same for us um, when we look at our debt account. It's not the fact that we have did something to get out of our bankruptcy when it came to sin. It was the fact that when um, we received the free gift of Christ Jesus, um, his justification, his righteousness was added to our account. So um, the, the debt that we once owed, Jesus satisfied that debt. But he's talking about Abraham. He says now in verse number five, based on his belief, faith, it was credited to him as righteousness. And then he goes on to talk about David, and then he's going to talk about Moses. But he says, just as David also speaks of the blessings <clears throat> On the man to whom God credits a righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. <coughs> and blessed is the man whose sins the Lord will not take into account. Once again, he, he's using an uh, accounting term. Um, you know, in accounting, you have. On one side of the ledger, on the ledger, you have what, y'all? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Right, right. So he's using, he's still using those terms to the fact that even with David, when David was quoting this um, in the psalm, let me see, what psalm was this? Psalm, uh, psalm 32. When David was quoting this, um, he even used, in verse number five, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Um, and then verse number nine of Romans, the fourth chapter, is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? while he was circumcised or uncircumcised. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while uncircumcised. 
so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And then verse number 12 says, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also, but who also follow in the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So um, once again, it's just establishing the fact that he became the father of faith because of his belief. Um, he was considered the father of faith prior to him being circumcised. Matter of fact, um, the Genesis account shows that Abraham wasn't circumcised until he was 99 years old. But he was considered the father of faith based on when he first believed. Um, and I want to say more about that, but I want to read um, the rest of this and then I want to say a little more about that. But verse number 13 says, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void. The promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us, of us all. Verse number 17, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, and hope against hope he believes, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Verse number 21, and being fully assured that what God had promised he was able also to perform, therefore it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who, was, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verse number 25. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions was raised because of our justification. Okay, that's as far as we're going to go. Um, we're not going to go into chapter number five. But I want to go back to the fact that he was considered the fa father of faith prior to circumcision. And um, I want to share what this chapter is not saying, where some people try to build um, doctrines out of that it is not saying. So some people, you know, they equate what Abraham did with what we should do. Um, if we are to appropriate what Jesus done on our behalf, all it takes for us to do is have faith in Jesus, which is true. But here's the thing, the way that they define faith is flawed. Uh, faith is not just a mental ascent. It's not just saying that I believe there's a big man in the sky. I believe that, um, you know, I believe that uh, gravity exists. I believe that there are deers in the woods. Um, that's not faith. Faith is believing, but you act, you behave in such a way that 
your actions dictate what you believe, even though you don't see it. Um, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, faith is the substance of things not seen, but hoped for, right? Um, I use the illustration of a deer, you know, and when I'm leaving here, I, I'm always thinking of deers because I know they're around. I don't see them, but I know they are around. So, so I, I, I try to keep my eyes on the road. I try to keep one foot close to the brakes because if I see a deer, I'm, I'm trying not to run into a deer. I know they're around. Even though I don't see them, I don't have night vision to see them. I don't have um, technology to see them, but I know they are in the area. So I drive consciously. Uh, um, I, I drive so, you know, just in case I encounter one, that I can possibly avoid one. So the same with Abraham, even though he believed, the Bible says he believed against all hope. He didn't just believe that God can do it, but he continued to act on the belief. He didn't give up. He didn't throw in the towel. Even though he was old in age, God promised him that he was going to have a son. He still believed that God can resurrect a dead womb in Sarah. He believed, and, and with that belief, you know, uh, amen, we adults in here, um, they had to keep trying. Uh, they didn't give up. Um, the Bible says he believed against all hope. Ordinarily, if you ain't got no faith, the situation is dead. It's, ain't no, it's, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. But the Bible says he believed against all hope, meaning he acted on what he believed. So some people, they created a doctrine. They say, well, you know, if you say that it's essential for you to be baptized, you are uh, nullifying belief in Jesus because now that's a work. Just believing in God alone is what saved you. But that's not what this chapter is saying. The chapter is saying that Abraham, he's the father of faith because we know faith come by hearing, right? Faith, if we have faith, we're going to follow through. That's what faith is. See, if we believe, that means that we're going to follow through. We believe in God. Okay, I believe in God. If I believe in God, what precedes belief is following his directions. I cannot say I believe God and I don't obey him. And there's many people in this world, we, we don't mind having Jesus as our Savior, but we forget that he became our Lord as well. And anytime he comes your Lord, he tells you what to do, basically. Uh, we don't mind him saving us from our iniquities, uh, saving us from our sins, but we forget the part that he became our Lord where he tells us what we are to do. Mm -hmm. So if, if we claim him as our Savior, we also got to follow what he tells us to do. So if I believe that he's my Savior, he didn't stop at belief. He got some commandments, right? So even if you even if you just think about baptism, faith come by hearing, right? Now listen to this. This is some people's arguments. Let's just go over there real quick. It's in the same book. Romans the 10th chapter. Let's let's look at it real quick. Romans the 10th chapter. Because this is what people get hung up on. Well, you know, you, you shouldn't, you will not need to get baptized. All you got to do is believe. And look what the Bible says. Look what Romans the 10th chapter says. Um, and we're going to read it real quick. Um, look what verse number 6 says. Starting at verse number 6 of Romans the 10th chapter. It says, but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you, this is what people get hung up on. 
that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? Um, so they say, you know, that's all you got to do is confess. You know, all you got to do is confess. And then let's, let's go on to um, read verse number 10 through 17. It says, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of God of, of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse number 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or my um, translation says the word of Christ. But I say surely they have never, but I say surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say unto Israel did not know, did they? First Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Okay, so I want to primarily deal with the fact, um, verse number nine, once again, where it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? And then also, um, so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by um, the word of God, right? So, in the King James Version, and I, I explained this before, verse number 10 says, with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation, right? Remember that little optive word, that four-letter word right there? Um, um, U N T O. Based on that word, what 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 is this verse not saying? Amen. It's got to lead up to salvation. There you go. There you go. Uh, the the operative word that we're looking for is found in Galatians third chapter verse number 20, 27. Let's just turn over there real quick. What is that, Jeremiah? Uh, Galatians the third chapter verse number twenty seven. So. Verse number 27 of Galatians, the third chapter, it says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, right? So the argument is still flawed. Going back to Romans, let's go back to Romans, the third chapter. I mean, yeah, the third chapter. But I'm going to give y'all why the argument is flawed in Romans, the 10th chapter. The argument is still flawed because if you say that it's only belief, Romans chapter 10, verse number 10, it says, and let me just read it again. It says, for whoever confesses with his mouth. So is confession a work? This apologetics right here, y'all might not care for this, but you know, this is what <laughs> this is what we have to study because it's some arguments that come up, but the best way to straight scripture out is with scripture. Um, so 
Are you saying that confession is a work? So at the end, you, if you don't believe that baptism is saying, okay, you ain't got to be baptized because that's a work. All right, at the end of the service, when people get an invitation, uh, do you want to be saved tonight? If you do, just raise your hand. Okay, somebody slip up their hand. Repeat this after me. Um, this confession brought death to Christ, but it bring everlasting life to you. I want you to repeat these words after me. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And with a, you know, I'm just making something else. I, I, I'm, I'm remorse for all my sins and, you know, so on and so forth. And, and they will say, well, that's just belief. That's not a work, but you still require them to confess. So is that a work? And, you know, when you look at the Bible, that's why we studied the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, when they was pricked in their heart, they said, men and brethren, what must we do in order to be saved? Y'all remember that? Okay. Uh, what, what, what did they tell them to do? Repent and be baptized. Y'all remember that? But guess what, y'all? In that chapter, in those verses, let me just read it real quick. Um, Acts 2, 38, right? Um, Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Now, in that verse, in that passage, we don't hear them saying, hear the word, believe the word, confess the word, repent and be baptized. You know why they didn't have to say it? Because they already did it. He just preached the gospel sermon. They heard it. They believed it. They initiated uh, what they needed to do. They the ones confess, men and brethren, what must we do? He didn't have to ask them to confess. They already confessed. So to get them in Christ Jesus, repent and be baptized. What, what's repentance? I told y'all before. What's the definition I gave y'all repentance? You can say it in your own words, but I just want to see if y'all can remember. Uh, change or turn away from. Change or turn away from. Okay, you you halfway there. It's one more part I want. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's one change, part. Change your nature. Change your yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all on the line. So, repentance is not changing from what you used to do. It's changing from who you were. Yeah. It's changing totally who you are. You are repenting of who you were, and you becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus. So it's not just changing behavior, it's changing who you are, right? Uh, so when he tells them to be baptized, this is being born again. This is regeneration. All things are made new, 2 Corinthians Chapter number 5, verse number 17. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. All things are made new. Example, Acts the ninth chapter. Saul, after he was baptized, he was no longer referred to as Saul. He was now referred to as who? Paul, because all things were made new. He was a new person in Christ Jesus. Same thing with all of us. I hope I hope all of us can say that. Uh, our nature has been changed. We were just known by our government name, but now, huh? Yeah, we got a new name. A new name. We we got the name that Christ has bestowed upon us. So I, I just wanted to deal with that argument. And it's more that could been, you know, could be said about that. Um, but if we believe we're going to follow through with the commandments that God has given us um, as we know from Hebrews 11 chapter the hall of faith 
All of it talks about what they did. It don't just talk about what they believe. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abel offered up a more excellent offering than his brother Cain. By faith, right? What's some of them other folks over there in uh, Hebrews 11 chapter? Hmm? I already said Noah. <laughs> you missed him. Uh, Abraham over there. Uh, we just looked at a couple not too long ago. We looked at Rahab. By faith, Rahab hid the spies. Uh, by faith, Joshua, and they marched around the walls of Jericho. By faith, Samson did what he did. By faith, Barak did what he did. Japha. Um, amen. Amen. Um, but all of it shows that they acted on their belief. It's not just a mental ascent. Because if you believe, you're going to, uh, let me see if I can say it the way that they say it. Um, faith is going to get in your feet. Amen. It's going to change the direction you go in. All right. Okay, we got to get to Romans, the third chapter. We're doing good on time. Any comments as we transition to Romans, the third chapter? No, I, I like to make a comment. Go ahead. Say faith changed the direction of your feet. So faith, you repent on faith. Yeah. Faith initiates, faith plants the seed, right? So if, if faith come by hearing, right? All of us heard the gospel. When we heard the gospel, it's planted in our heart. Just as on the day of Pentecost, it was planted in their heart. They were pricked in their heart. Now they were interested in, okay, what must I do in order to be right with God? What must I do in order to be justified by God? What must I do to be right with Christ Jesus? So we look for further revelation so we can uh, carry out that revelation. Um, that, that's the, you know, that's the Easiest way I can explain it, you know, if you go back to the whole hall of faith. Mm -hmm. I like this theory, theory of faith is the seed yeah. there. Without that, you won't repent either. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but if you go back to the hall of faith, all of it was initiated with hearing. And the prime example was Rahab. Remember Rahab? Mm -hmm. I heard yes, that's it. Yeah. what your gods did. I already know what's going to happen. I got faith. Yeah. Based on my faith and what your God did, now it's changing my actions. I'm going to hide the spies. No, okay, y'all leaving, but when y'all come back, I got enough faith that if God said this city going to be destroyed, I got enough faith it's going to be destroyed. When y'all come back, I want to be saved, and also I want my household to be saved. What must I do to be saved? So that same that same scarlet rope that I let you guys down on, they tell her, they said, keep it out the window. And this is going to be the identifying mark so your house won't be destroyed. Go ahead, Sister McCarthy. No, I, I just say, um, with now making it more connection, you see, with the faith, They knew the faith, they, they saw, they had already had the faith because pre, it was previous. I got that. Yeah. They, and, but no, they no. gained the faith yeah. before the fact that when they say, what, what must we do? They'd already believed they had the faith that it was God that they crucified, that they done. They had the faith that he was, he, this is the real God. So when they asked the question, what must I do? That's what you know where the, pre, the um, repent and baptize, be baptized coming at because they already had the faith that what they've done was they had already crucified God. Amen. Amen. Um, so if you have the faith, 
you will repent and follow God, but if you don't follow it, you say you got faith, but yet you don't follow you it, you're not convinced. You're not convinced you have the faith. You don't have to, you're saying it, but you don't actually have it. Uh, amen, amen. I, and I let Brother Bud make his um, comment, but it was something that was provoked when you said that. Go ahead. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What y'all were trying to understand for a long, long time, and you may not be able to answer it for me tonight, but maybe later. Uh, here was the beginning with Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, and then come Abraham. And now they ain't wrong with this, say they are Abraham's seed. Well, I never understood why. Why did, what happened to be the North Sea, the Adam of Adam Sea? I jumped these guys and, and come to Abraham see that when they both when all of them had faith and so forth and so on, but maybe Abraham had more faith. Well, Abraham he preceded Noah. Um remember he came after Noah. No, he came before. He came before. Yeah, he came before. Um no, he didn't. You're right. Because you're right. Flood. Yeah, you're right. And then he'll come Abraham and Lot. He'll mm -hmm. move the other way. Yeah. Um, well, based on from, you know, Romans, the fourth chapter, and I think it's Galatians, the third <laughs> chapter, um, it was pretty much that God had entered into this covenant with Abraham. That, that's what made it special as well, because remember, Abraham was to get the seed. That, that's the main reason that Abraham is prominent as well because it was through his seed line that Jesus came into the earth realm. But, um, you know, in a physical sense, all of us still stem from Noah because they were the only people. But far as faith, um, all I can go back is to the Genesis account, Genesis the twelfth chapter, that you know when God had the conversation with him, he believed in such a way that God entered into that covenant with him, and it was based off of um, belief. Um, you know, through you, all the descendants of the world are going to be blessed. And he was talking about the seed, you know, because Galatians explained that he was talking about the seed of Christ Jesus. So. Why he don't equate that to Noah versus Abraham? That's pretty much what you answer, right? Yeah, I use it Adam and Eve. Well, you know Adam and Eve, they fail. And I think you gave an answer because God made a covenant with yeah. Abraham. I think that's what you yeah, mean. that that's primarily. But now I can't answer why he chose Abraham okay. versus the other ones. I, okay. I, I'm I'm not sure if the scriptures give an answer for that. Well, the covenant part, um, I'm getting more clear. I'm wondering why that's for you. Yeah, yeah. But it was based on that covenant he um, entered in with him because he, he started off, he said, by, by um, you, all the descendants of the earth are going to be blessed. First, he started off talking about he was going to be the father of um, many. No, he expanded it. He started off by saying he was going to be the father of uh, I, I can't say it right now. Then he said many nations, and then he expanded it a little more. If you look at it a little, uh, every time he um, looked at it. Uh, any other comments? All right. So I want to go back to where we left off on last week, which is Romans, the third chapter. And we're going to read leading up to chapter number four. Um, once again, keep in mind that he just got through talking to those who were primarily Jews who considered themselves, you know, um, God's favor because they had the law. Um, we pick up at verse number eight. He says, and why not say. Let me go to the King James Version because that's the version that I was using. <clears throat> Um, he says, and not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then, are we better than they? No, and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one.
There is none that understand this. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used they have used deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet. Now listen to this, we just got through talking about feet. Um, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says unto them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law in the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now I want to pause there for a second. Because oftentimes we we quote we quote we quote verse number twenty three, but we got to see that verse number twenty three is surrounded by verse number twenty two and verse number twenty four and twenty five. Twenty two and twenty um, four is the good news. Twenty three is the reality. And sometimes we dwell on the reality, but, you know, we need to be sharing the good news. The good news is we all have, even though all of us have sinned, Jesus Christ, verse number 22 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Then verse number 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Once again, the redemption is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So, Chapter number one primarily talks about what, y'all, again? In your own words, if you had to sum it up, he primarily dealt with what? In your own words. Chapter number two, in your own words, he primarily dealt with. So chapter number one, if I had to sum it up, he primarily just talked about how the Gentiles who did not have the law, even though they didn't have a law, they were a law unto themselves. They still fell short of God's glory without the law. Chapter number two, he talks about the Jews, how even though they had the law, they still fell short of God's glory with the law. And then chapter number three, he talks about all. Oh, okay, don't feel good about yourself. Don't start thinking you better than the Gentiles because you had the law and you had a religious system. You had the Sabbath. You had the temple. You had the high priest. You had um, the young Kippur. You had the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Weeks. Don't think that you better off or think you better than the Gentiles. Because you had uh, religion. He says, yet and still, they didn't retain God in their thoughts, even though they had the law. So, in chapter number three, he says, the Gentiles without the law, the Jews with the law, still, uh, what was that verse? I'm going to go back to the verse where he said, uh, um, verse number 12. Listen to what it says. 
No, let's go back to verse number 10 of chapter number 3. He said, there is none righteous, Jew or Gentile. Don't, don't, don't get it twisted. None righteous. No, not one. There is none that understands us. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. So he was reflecting back on what he said about the Gentiles and the Jews. Neither, all of us need Christ Jesus. Amen. So verse number 23, that's why we quote it so much. Um, let me just read it. For all have sinned. Some people think that it say, y'all have sinned. <laughs> no, it say, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us need Christ Jesus. Verse number 22, go back once again. It says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Gentile and Jew need Christ Jesus. You cannot be justified by the law. Matter of fact, the Bible says, we just read it, the law was just to reveal that how far we had failed. The law just showed us how um, high God's standards was. Amen. You know, um, on every every company, they usually have a, a manual, some policies, and you know, as soon as you go up in there and you fill out your application, and they they make you even if you don't read it, they give you all these forms to sign <laughs> because they want you to know we got some rules around here. Okay, you do this, you do that. Uh, you 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 do this, you do that. After three write-ups, you know, and you might not even get three write-ups. You know, this at will state. Uh, what's that? What's the rule? Uh, so they give you all these forms so you'll know that okay, we got rules. Now let's 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 say if they didn't give you all the forms and you never signed it, when something happened and you bought, well, I didn't know. No, I'm just saying if they didn't give you all the forms, you know. They didn't give you all that stuff, and they didn't have rules. Every man would be a law unto himself. You know, because at the end of the day, sister so-and-so, oh, it ain't going to be sister so-and-so at the workplace. It might be, but uh, <laughs> uh, she came in at, you know, 4 o'clock. I wanted to come in at 5, you know, it really ain't no standard. You know, it really ain't no standard. So the law was to show that God has a standard. And being that we were in our sin condition, we would never be able to meet the standard of God. So what this shows us is that Jesus was necessary for all of us to um, fulfill the wrath of God. That's the best way I can explain. I wish I had an easier way to break it down, but that's the words that Isaiah used. That what Jesus did satisfied the wrath of God. So it met the standard. Even though we fell short, being that we accepted what Jesus did, it satisfies the wrath even though Rightfully, we should have been fired before our 90 days was up. Mm -hmm. On day one, we should have been fired because we violated. But based on what Jesus did, and we accepted what Jesus did, now we're 90 days in. Mm -hmm. Now we got two years in. But it ain't... <laughs> Y'all lay help me up here. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to use the workplace as a, a, a parallel. Maybe this might not be the best parallel. Because y'all work hard. We work hard on our job. Uh -uh. But, but, but at the end of the day, we still know it's by God's grace. Because we know, we know if it wasn't for God's grace. Amen. Amen. If it wasn't for God's grace. Amen. You got to work hard to get God too. Because yeah, Satan's on your track. Yeah. They're trying to turn you back. So you got to work hard in the staying in Christ. But, but I like what they say, you know, um, the definition of mercy. Definition of mercy is someone want to say it? Mm. It's unmerited favor. 
Yeah, yeah. That's God not giving us what we rightfully deserve. And then grace is what, y'all? Yeah, yeah. Giving us what we don't deserve. So even though, you know, we fall short, God still give us grace as a child of God. Even though we fall short, he still give us grace. That's where, that's why we sing that song, Brother Button. Mm -hmm. Amazing grace. That's right. Because it's amazing. <laughs> God made me look better than I actually am. <laughs> Way better than I actually am. I ain't talking about Henry. I'm talking about all of us for that matter. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Humanity. Um, amen. So, so verse number 23 is crouched between verse number 22 and 24 for a reason because Jesus in verse, verse number 22 and he's also in verse number 24 to surround our sin. Uh, um, verse number 25 says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him whom which believeth in Jesus. I'm, I want to come back. I'm going to end on verse number 26 because I want to give an illustration. Perhaps you, you heard it before, but I think it's a good illustration. Verse number 27 says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Or of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. And then that's when we went into um, how faith looks to God where um, certain things are accredited to our account. But Verse number 26 says, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So, someone explained it this way. God is holy. So, if God is holy, that means that he has to be just. We know that God told us that, you know, his word will not return unto him void. If he tell us that, you know, we, the day you eat of the tree, you should surely die. Um, if he told us that, you know, if we practice iniquities, we will be cast out. In order for him to be holy, he still has to hold sin accountable. So how does God be holy but still merciful? Amen. That's a rhetorical question, but I want us to think about that as I give this illustration. Um, you know, in order for him to be holy and still merciful because you know just like our 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 court systems for the most part if something happened to us and we go to the courts oftentimes especially if someone does something towards us we're looking for justice right we're not looking for the courts to be merciful we're looking for them to be just if it's the law and I've been violated. I'm looking for them to be just. That's what they're set up for, right? <laughs> um, but how is God able to be just and still be merciful? So an illustration that I heard before, 
um, they said that it was a man who he was a judge and it was a, a woman who came to his courtroom and the woman had been guilty of um, stealing something from the store something to eat and yet still you know the penalty was that she had to pay um, a fee and she was also um, had to you know pay what's that when you got to pay more than what it costs interest but it's another word for it um, um, that's slowing down my illustration I wish I would have studied for the word <laughs> what's that word I can't think of it anyway but um, they it's said that the, hmm? restitution. yeah restitution there you go uh, she had to pay restitution as well so the judge he said now I can't excuse what she did because the penalty is that she paid um for what she stole, but also restitution. So he said, I'm going to hold her to that standard. But they said what the judge did in order for him to justify or fulfill what was required of her punishment, the judge decided to take off his robe and leave it up in the bench. And he came down as a man. He left the robe in um, what they call that area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, up there. Uh, <laughs> he left it up there. And he came down as a man and he went in his pocket, went in his wallet, and he gave the woman the money that she needed to pay back for the food she stole and the restitution. So he not only was just, but he was her justifier as well. So they say when we look at God, that's what he did through Christ Jesus. Not only was he God the son, but ultimately he died to satisfy the penalty. Remember the ways of sin is death. So he died to justify us so we wouldn't have to die. Because he's the sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Anybody want to expound on that? Or or that's clear? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. So so that's what Christ Jesus did on our behalf. And I, I, I'm thankful for it on tonight because all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Now what the word we got to get out is the fact that and John deals with this that until we accept Christ Jesus the wrath of God is laid up for mankind until we accept the free gift that Christ Jesus has done on our behalf so it's just like it's just like being in debt all this time and all we got to do is say, okay, I, I, I sell the monies that, you know, that you plan to give me so I can get out of debt. But instead of some people doing that, they say, no, nah, I'm going to work. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get myself together. But the debt is so steep, you can't work a lifetime in order to be right with God. I'm just using I'm using some terms that we are familiar with. We can't do enough in this lifetime in order to be pleasing to God. So we have to accept what Christ Jesus has done on our behalf. So that's pretty much what the Roman writer is talking about. Even Abraham, it was accredited to him. He didn't work for it. It was accredited to him. By faith, he benefited from it. By faith. Any comments? All right, all right. <laughs>